Hello, today is Wednesday, October 23rd, and welcome to episode 376 of Fault Lines, the National Security Institute's podcast that gets you quickly up to speed three times a week on the national security and foreign policy debates shaking up America. I'm NSI Senior Fellow Morgan Vigna. I'm joined today by NSI's Deputy Executive Director, Martha Miller, NSI Fellow Jessica Jones, and my fellow Senior Fellow, Lester Munson. Today, we are talking about the 16th annual BRICS Summit, which kicked off yesterday in Kazan, Russia. The OGs of the forum include Brazil, Russia, India, and China. South Africa later joined in 2010, and this year, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, and the United Arab Emirates will attend the summit as its new members. Saudi Arabia's membership is still pending, but the kingdom is expected to have representation at the summit. BRICS's guiding objective is to challenge Western dominance of global governance and financial institutions and reduce global reliance on the U.S. dollar and the SWIFT system, and basically redefine the global world order. As the world has witnessed Russia suffer, or excuse me, as the world has witnessed Russia suffer isolation and economic penalties for its atrocities against Ukraine, other powers are increasingly worried that the West could weaponize its economic power against them. Last year, Russian President Vladimir Putin attended the BRICS summit virtually due to the ICC warrant out for his arrest. This year, as host, President Putin is campaigning for the BRICS Bridge, a digital payment system that would allow countries to send and receive money while sidestepping Western sanctions. Each year, BRICS influence continues to expand as more nations express their interest in adjoining the partnership and reducing their reliance on the West. This year, leaders from other interested countries will also be in attendance, including Rush Turkish President uh, Erdogan and Vietnamese Prime Minister uh, Chin. The expanded alliance will now represent 25% of the world's GDP and almost half of the global population, raising concerns among Western allied nations about the future of the Western world order. So, Martha, starting with you. BRICS membership and influence continues to expand as more states express interest in joining. How concerned should the United States and its allies be about the group's influence? What should we be doing to prevent BRICS from either taking away critical allies and advantages away from the United States or um, causing problems for, for, for Western countries in general? So I think this is more symbolic than anything else. This is uh, an attempt to... It's like in a demonstration of um, dissatisfaction with the current U.S.-led world order. Um, I think they, you know, yes, they, they seek to challenge U.S. influence, but their internal divisions and their competing priorities actually make it a, less of a unified threat and more of a signal to the United States to strengthen our own global partnerships. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, it is concerning, you know, Turkey, Egypt, the UAE, these are you know, important uh, partners to the United States. I think they are actually seeking this uh, as an opportunity to hedge their bets, um, not so much about genuinely abandoning the West or abandoning the United States. It's more about them, you know, diversifying their um, economic partnerships and gaining leverage uh, on the global stage. Yeah. So Jess, Martha thinks the the BRICS influence is, is overstated here. You know, what do you see as the incentive for countries to, to join BRICS? Why would a state like Egypt um, and the United Arab Emirates, UAE, which receives considerable funding from the United States military, for, for their militaries from the United States, um, and of course the UAE hosts an American military base, why would they be interested in, in membership of BRICS? Yeah, to begin, I, you know, I largely agree with Martha. I think BRICS is a, another demonstration of these kind of growing middle powers, some of the original BRICS players and other countries that are now have enough political and economic clout that they don't need to fall in line always with perhaps what U.S. interests might be. And they can be a little more transactional in the partnerships, trade deals, forums like this that they seek to enter into. And we really can't do much to do too much about it. I mean, the fact that Erdogan's there and we've talked a lot about Turkey here on the show is, is an example of that. Um, 
but to Martha's point, I think BRICS seems more a venue for venting than it is for actual productive outcomes. You bring up it's the 16th year they've met. I, we have not ever discussed anything that they have accomplished. Um, so maybe this bridge will be the first thing, but I don't see it. You know, I think countries are there to vent. I think it's at least a forum for which a lot of, you know, if you're not a member of the G7 or the G20, you actually get a forum to vent your, you know, or um, exercise your, your ability to speak on what are important values and priorities for your country that you might not have other outlets for. So the U.S. can perhaps consider what other kind of forums they can create or engage in where they're speaking to powers out, you know, countries outside their normal uh, G20. I do think as countries, as more countries seek to enter BRICS, the large tent makes it even more difficult to imagine them being able to take targeted action. To Martha's point, there's countries with really different um, motivations within BRICS that have their own conflicts, China, India, Iran's joining, that's going to ruffle a few feathers there. And as they continue to grow, it, it's difficult to imagine what they're going to accomplish. And, you know, I think as perhaps if Russia continues, if it's if Russia and China and Iran are pushing an anti-West, truly anti-West agenda, I think that's going to alienate some of the countries that are in BRICS, like India, Argentina is already dropping out of their, their uh, membership um, a potential membership join. I think that's a dangerous move that will even actually diminish BRICS's um, influence if it has any. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Wes, I want to get your, your thoughts on um, the influence that the, the BRICS forum has, but I also want you to talk a little bit about um, sort of the symbolism here and, and the potential impact of it. I mean, here we have Vladimir Putin being hosting the summit. He's being recognized um, as a you know, legitimate world leader. Um, he's got an ICC warrant out for his arrest. We've got our allies and partners um, joining him in, in Kazan. We've also got the UN Secretary General um, also there to, to meet with Putin. Um, and this is despite the, the many, many atrocities, the ongoing atrocities that are um, happening in Ukraine um, at the behest of uh, um, Vladimir Putin. So what's your take? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> so this this summit is happening in the city of Kazan, Russia, which is a very interesting place. It's the crossroads uh, historically of the Tatars and the Bulgars and the uh, you know, various population movements over the last 1500 years. Famously, the wok was invented there, a major contribution to international cuisine uh, about eight or 900 years ago. I think that's way more significant than what is happening this week in Kazan. Uh, yes, it's kind of interesting that these countries are willing to join BRICS and show up in the same room with Vladimir Putin, who is a in many, in many ways, a pariah internationally. I'm not too worried about the ICC question, Morgan. Last time I checked, we are not a, a component of the ICC. We have not signed up for that either. Uh, so that, that I'm not sure, we might be speaking out of uh, both sides of our mouth uh, on that one. Uh, but I think uh, it's not great that the Secretary General is going. I think that might be a mistake. But as for the rest of it, um, it was never very realistic that Russia would be totally isolated from the rest of the world over its uh, ridiculous actions in Ukraine. Uh, Russia remains a big country. It has a lot of nuclear weapons, it has a lot of energy resources. Uh, we can impact decision-making, uh, I think internationally on specific issues with respect to Russia, but the idea that we would totally isolate Putin, I think was, was never really in the cards. Uh, and, and, I, and I agree with the earlier comment. I mean, BRICS has really not accomplished much in the world. And I think frankly, uh, as we were discussing earlier, as the membership becomes more diffuse, it becomes less likely that it will ever be a significant challenge to U.S. interests. As far as the dollar goes, the only real threat to the dollar is our is ourselves. If we choose to overspend and we choose to over sanction, then we're going to put our dominant currency at risk. So we just need to be better stewards of that. None of the things that are happening in Kazan this week are going to be significant related to that. All right. Well, you he heard it here on Fault Lines. Bricks doesn't matter. That's a wrap. Thanks to Devlin Burney, Claude Jennings, Alice Roosevelt, and the entire NSI staff for their help in producing today's episode. Join us again on Friday, October 25th, for our next episode of Fault Lines. Fault Lines is now on YouTube, so check out our channel for a video of today's episode. If you like what you heard, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. <laughs>